Uh, the next speaker is uh, Angelina Galitova, who is a uh, board member of the California Independent System Operator and also one of the founders of Renewable 100 Project. Well, thank you so much. And of course, it's a pleasure to be here and, and, and to host this event. And I, I am one of the founders of Renewables 100. I'm also on the board of the Independent System Operator and in tune of what um, Jose just mentioned. We also have a nuclear power plant that's experiencing problems down south, the San Onofre Nuclear Power Station. Um, amply referred to as songs, and I'd just like to say that as the agency responsible for reliability on the grid, we've taken all precautions to make sure that we're going to have a summer that is reliable. There will be power for San Diego, do not worry about that, and if the utility does not come online, and we hope it doesn't at half power, <laughs> with a very neat exemption by the Nuclear Regulatory Agency, that there should be no fear and that we're fine. And if you hear stories that there is a danger and we may be experiencing blackouts, they're not true. The blackouts we experienced were with San Onofre Online. So this is the panel on where we're gonna be talking about policy drivers. And what are the policy drivers that are necessary for renewable energy? I've been in the utility industry for quite a while now and it's never been more exciting. I mean, energy is becoming sexy. It's becoming fun. All of a sudden, energy is not only about generating a large power station, it's about electric vehicles, it's about storage, it's about information technology, it's about microgrids, it's about demand response, it's about energy efficiency, it's about changing usage patterns, it's about taking the grid that we have and making it better and making it more efficient and making sure that we're leaner, meaner, and we're not sitting in the dark drinking warm beer, our beers are just as cold, our rooms are just as bright, but we're doing it cost effectively. And it's really inspiring to see that it's a grassroots movement and it's starting with the cities and the municipalities because you know what? When there's a vacuum, the vacuum gets filled. We've got goals for our renewable future. We have a 33% RPS goal and we're going to meet that and we're going to exceed it. So what are our objectives? To increase the overall renewable energy content, to create jobs in new industries, improve the environment, mitigate climate change, increase energy security, support new technologies. Success requires commitment. We need to commit to make sure that this happens. There's plenty of greenwashing going around. I won't name names, but there are certain cities that say we've reached many goals, we've achieved many objectives, and they really haven't done very much. Or they say they have a feed-in tariff, but the feed-in tariff doesn't actually work and won't result in anything meaningful. You need to have top-down regulations. I'm also a, a lawyer, and I understand that policy and regulation are important. And regulatory policy and how you structure that regulatory policy has a tremendous impact on how the industry develops. It's not something that happens on its own. Regulatory policy typically is broken down into three areas. Your traditional regulation, you have mandates, standards, public education. Carbon pricing, carbon taxes, cap and trade, very complex, very complicated, could work, we don't know, but it's not transparent and easy to see. Then you've got innovative policy. It takes into account all of these new technologies, all of these cross sections between energy, transportation, building, water, and how do we all work together to make sure that we've got a coherent system. We're going to hear a lot about the feed-in tariffs. The feed-in tariffs is probably the best mechanism we have right now. We need to have a formula, though, that allows us to incorporate the new industries, the R&D, the new technologies that are coming in. It needs to be flexible enough to do it. So what is a policy that creates an environment where we can work? And it's the TLC policy, transparency, longevity, certainty and consistency. It needs to be long-term, it needs to be consistent. We've all seen the experiences from the 80s and even in the 90s where you have a knee-jerk policy that only lasts three years you don't have development of manufacturing, you don't have development of new technologies, and typically you're much more expensive. But you also need to have the other element, which Dr. Martineau also noted very well. The policies must address the return on investment. That has to be in there. You need to mitigate risk. You need to address the non-financial bar barriers, such as interconnection and being able to get uh, paid is what you need to do uh, once you start generating. That's why the development of renewable energy based on a very comprehensive policy, which is the feeding tariff in Germany, which started in the year 2000, was amended in the year 2004, which is when solar took off, was a very easy policy. If you install a solar system, 
You get a fixed rate of return for 25 years. You know exactly what it is. You get immediate interconnection and access to the grid, and the utility pays you. So it encouraged early adoption. But on the other hand, it very clearly outlined how that incentive, because it is an incentive and not a subsidy, drops down over time. So it encouraged innovation, so that the folks who were waiting were taking advantage of lower prices, but they were also getting a lower feed-in tariff. The installed capacity, and this is just photovoltaic in Germany, and we've seen this slide. Just because you have a comprehensive law that started in 2004, look at the skyrocketing effect. Germany, with the solar insulation equivalent of Juneau, Alaska, has 60% lower installation prices than the U.S., and they have more solar than us. It's really pretty amazing. Right now, they're at about 30,000 megawatts, and we just celebrated the installation of 1,000 as a big milestone. So regulation does play a role, and it does encourage the market. If you look at total installed capacity, that's in 2011, those are all countries, mostly that have feeding tariffs that you see at the very top. It may not be perfect, but obviously it works as an incentive. On a yearly basis, Italy in 2011 had about 9,000 megawatts installed in one year, which was pretty incredible with a feeding tariff program. The US as a whole had 1.7. The trends are also very interesting because renewable energy is distributed, very, very highly distributed. It can be on the microgrids, it can be on the grid level, and it's truly power to the people. The installation ownership is mostly individuals. 40% of the renewable energy in Germany is owned by individuals, 9% by industrial customers, very few by investment funds, only 11%, and the utilities own a mere 13%. While here we see the opposite, tend to be owned by the utilities. German ownership of wind, 52% owned by individuals who are getting a feed-in tariff and a rate of return on their investment. German ownership of solar PV, 39% by individuals, 19% by industrial. And it's very, very highly distributed. It gives reliability to the distribution system and reliability to the um, transmission system, which is also very important for whoever operates the grid. The size and distribution of the PV6 systems, again, smaller, distributed, at the load where you need it, no line losses, and no actually impact on the large transmission grids. Over 65% is under 200 kW. That's a small commercial size. 82% smaller than one megawatt in terms of solar. Per capita in select markets, and this is of course courtesy of Paul Guy. <laughs> again, we see the feed-in tariff countries much higher than the countries that do not have feed-in tariffs as a goal. Employment, huge job growth. Again, if you start in 2004 of job growth up to 2012, that's almost 380,000 jobs that have been added to the economy. There's a very robust employment. That's the largest growth in terms of job sector. It also creates diversity. It creates diversity of a very reliable fuel supply because renewables are fossil-free, inflation-proof, Many of them distributed, you don't even need a pipeline. So why not invest in that technology that makes sense? Your whole cost is your upfront investment. The investments, look at the growth of investments in, in, in the various sectors, starting with hydropower, geothermal, and of course the largest inf investment going into photovoltaics, and Germany is exporting those technologies. And then you've got revenues from those investments too. It's not a surprise that the largest chunk of investment in capacities and generation right now is renewables and not the fossil industry, which is what we all would have thought. Targets, Eric Martineau mentioned, many countries, many cities have targets. 100% is no longer a pie in the sky dream. 100% is now becoming a reality. It should be the new norm. We should be able to reach 100% by 2050. And it's doable. We've got the technologies. We need some breakthroughs, but we can make it happen. Development of new generation is costly. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of money. Not so with renewables. Development of transmission takes a lot of money. So as we develop our assets for the grid of the future, we've got to be very cognizant of what that future is going to be. We've got to have a plan. We've got to have targets, milestones, and reach them. When you have a comprehensive plan, it actually works. You can kind of see the policies that make sense. Germany is that nice green line that follows through and into the growth. The United States is the brown line that bumps along at the bottom. And the analysis that we did, which was pretty shocking, was that in 1983, the US was at 15% for renewable energy. 
and in, 19, in, in 2012, we were only at 12.7%. So instead of increasing our renewable energy percentage, the US is actually dropping. So we need to figure out what we're doing wrong with our legislation to be able to move along faster. Do we need space? You know, there are lots of misperceptions are there that we don't have enough space and we're not able to, to power the world with renewables. Well, all it takes is 0.07% of the world land area to be able to power the whole world with renewables. If we wanted to do it centralized in just one spot, we've got enough disturbed land, we've got enough roofs, we've got to be able to move into an industry which is like the construction industry, building integrated. Energy should become a part of the generation mix and that's easy to do. Everybody loves it. This is the cathedral in, in Los Angeles, our, our Lady of the Angels with the Cardinal over there and he was the first one when they were constructing it saying, we need to have solar, we need to have the Lord's power powering our, our, our cathedral. And he was climbing up the ladders, really exciting, in a big robe. And I was there with him saying, do I look up the robe? Do I not look up the robe? When will I have a chance to look up the rope of a cardinal another time? So I did. He was wearing a suit. But it was, it was interesting. Um, electric transportation in the public sector, very, very important. We need to have mass transportation storage. I love storage and electric vehicles and idea of how do we decouple the battery from the vehicle, bring down the cost, who owns that battery? What can you do with the battery? While you have the electric vehicle, you can certainly use it for storage. I'm really excited by two-way communication. You can actually tell the ISO or the utility, hey, you know what, during peaks, drain my battery for 20 or 30% and then pay me a dollar a kilowatt hour because I gave you peaking power. And the more electric vehicles we have, the better it will be. We've got to make sure that they are solar powered and that they have renewable energy and that's, and we're off to the races. Hey, even the Republicans love electric vehicles. There's McKay. Well, sure, we like our fast cars, but now we've got the Tesla, so there's no excuse. And there's a very exciting study coming out from the George Washington University about what it costs to be driving solar on an electric vehicle. And right now we're spending maybe 20 cents a mile to move a vehicle. If we've got an electric car, we can be spending five cents a mile to move that vehicle. That can pay for the battery. Maybe the utilities can lease the batteries and have an own bill payment system. That gives them a new lease in life. If you want to upgrade your battery, take that battery out, use it for storage. And then the utilities can benefit from that as well. It's really for the first time, becoming exciting to be a part of the utility business. And if the utilities want to get in on the game, they can have a really good time and capture a huge market. So how do you design the perfect fr framework? What are your objectives? How do you create a level playing field? Uh, one of my mentors told me, look, Angelina, there's never going to be a playing field. The only playing field is the graveyard. So get over yourself and just move on. <laughs> But we do need to have a recognition that renewables deserve a seat at the table and they should be, and the values and benefits should be quantified and externalities should be monetized. Do we have a system that is a TLC system, transparency, longevity, and consistency? You need to ensure the interconnection. You need to build it so it's flexible enough to include the new technologies and to accommodate the changes and encourage innovation. And if you have those things, you know, those precious resources that we have, on top of having a huge economic benefit and independence, a secure system and not going to war over fossil fuel, we'll be able to save the water and the air that we have on this earth because it's not that much. You see the small blue sphere? The whole world is dry. That includes all the water in the oceans, the seas, the ice caps, the lakes, the rivers, as well as the groundwater, the atmospheric water, and even the water in you, your dog, and your tomato plant. So we've got to figure out we are, how we are adapting. And it's not the strongest of species who survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. The world is changing. The power sector is evolving. We've got to make sure that we are ready for it. And I do come from Eastern Europe, so power to the people. Solitariat, unite, and let's evolve the energy for system into a 100% renewable energy future. Thank you. <laughs> If you're not awake now, there is a problem. Yes, Angelina is always good for waking up an audience. Um, I, I think it's good that this, this uh, conference that we're having here today is not just about electricity, it's not just about renewables and electricity systems, but also about uh, the problem with transport and the liquid fuels issue here in the United States. And that's why there's a segment on electric vehicles and transport. That's very good, and I'm glad to, that the organizers of the conference included that in this session. 
And I'm glad that um, Angelina brought up the whole concept of who owns renewable energy because what we've seen, the growth of renewable energy in Germany today is being driven by people who want to see that renewable future come much quicker than it would have come otherwise, and they're buying those solar panels and they're buying those windmills. And I'm, I'm afraid to ask the question because I know the answer, how many of the many wind turbines, the thousands of wind turbines we have in California are owned by us, um, are owned by farmers? And the answer is none. So, so.